All right. So yeah, um, Grace and I, uh, you know, are here tonight just to, uh, to give our analysis of the uh, SAT results. Uh, this assessment was taken um, just uh, a couple months ago on October 14th, uh, 2020, uh, by our seniors. Uh, typically, this assessment is taken in the spring when when they're juniors, but of course, due to COVID, uh, they weren't able to take it uh, at that time. So there's about a seven you know seven month lag uh, with um, you know no in person uh, math instruction during that time. But uh, as you know, prior to beginning this presentation tonight, I just want to acknowledge and thank Grace for putting this uh, slide presentation together and and crunching the data for us. Um, just wanted to give her credit for that. So we'll begin now. Um, so we'll talk through a couple of things, what data we have available, um, the high level of scores and benchmarks in comparison to state and national averages. Uh, and then we'll go beyond that um, high level to think about some distributions and tracking. And we'll talk really about our recommendations and next steps. So just a couple things about the SAT before we begin, um, you know, and what makes it kind of a unique assessment, something that maybe, you know, our kids not all that familiar with, depending upon if they've taken a practice assessment or not, but it's a, it's a obviously quick, it's a timed assessment. Uh, some questions are designed to be tricky to, to really uh, test the students understanding the concepts. Um, many of the questions, which is a good thing, uh, really uh, contain ninth grade math. That's really just dressed up with some complex terminology. Um, the data analysis questions, are really common sense and uh, really um, demonstrate a kid's ability to think critically and problem solve, which I'm all for as a, as a former science teacher. And um, I saw I saw a lot of similarities between that, those questions, because I've taken the, the math SAT myself and uh, actually this, this most recent one, and um, the New Hampshire science assessment, the, the, the SAS assessment. So um, come back to that another time. but. Uh, lastly, um, you know, another key point to make about this assessment is it really requires the students to be able to mentally sort through questions by type of math um, and then the level of difficulty, uh, which Grace will get to next. Yeah, so what you'll see in the, um, the data that's reported out is questions of three types, heart of algebra, which is that ninth grade math of linear equations and systems. Problem solving and data analysis are quantitative literacy questions about surveys and some basic probability. Passport to advanced math gets um, to a bit more of 11th grade content with quadratics and some cubics. Um, and you'll see those three categories reported out in the data later. Um, there's also some questions that fall under additional topics in math. That's a, a really small category, so they don't separate um, scores into that category. Uh, and then every question is rated as easy, medium, or hard. So in terms of available data, uh, un unfortunately, we discovered that it's, it's limited. And um, there's, be, there's a change I'll talk about in, in, a, in a minute. But so it's really difficult for us to look at trends over time, trends in how our students have done. As you can see from this, this uh, table, um, you know, the class of 2021, that's a class that just took the assessment in October. We have their scores, the benchmarks, question analysis, which going back to Grace's previous slide would be you know, how they do in the heart of algebra, how they do in problem solving, passport, um, math. We don't have the actual specific questions. Uh, hopefully we can get those because that's always interesting to see how they did on individual questions. Uh, the most recent class to take assessment back in spring of 2019, the class of 2020, we have their scores and their bench, the benchmarks, but that's it. And then College Board decided to, you know, no longer maintain scores from 2019 back. Uh, and everybody was surprised by that. Um, so we're looking to get the data maybe from the state. We don't have it now. Uh, but that being said, uh, we can you know, with what we have, uh, with uh, the work Grace has done with the math department so far, you know, we can make rec recommendations and come up with strategies for uh, improving our performance on the math SAT moving forward. So uh, it's not like, this is not an excuse. This is not, you know, you know, we don't have the data so we can't make recommendations. 
Um, these are the parts that most people have probably seen publicly. This is um, the average score, score the last, the last of test years. takers. Um, and the percentage of our students who met benchmark in each content area. Um, the benchmark in reading and writing is 480. The benchmark in math is quite a bit higher at 530. And that's one reason why you see a discrepancy in the percentage of students who met benchmark in reading and math. The benchmark is literally higher in math. Um, so we wanted to acknowledge these numbers, um, but also to say we're going to put them in context and start to unpack them because we know that this fall um, was very weird, that the students in this graduating class have had a very different experience than, uh, than previous years of students. Um, so we want to kind of go beyond just this high level into some more detail. So how do we compare to the state and uh, nationally? So some of this data was in the previous screen. Use my cursor here. Uh, Grace pointed out the, the benchmark for the evidence-based reading and writing. Uh, it's 480 for the math. It's 530. And as you can see, um, you know, in, in 2019, our um, school performance was comparable to the nation, still below um, the state. And then we had, you know, a, a drop this year, especially. I mean, maybe not. Sorry, not in the reading and writing performance, because that went from 54 to 55%. Um, the nation and state average uh, scores went up. Uh, so we're, we're lagging um, in, in reading and writing um, for 2020. Math, um, you know, again, pretty big discrepancy between our school performance on this assessment and the states and, and the nations for that matter. You know, back in 2019, we're fairly close to the national um, average and um, ours went down, national average went up. Um, the last two columns I'm not gonna get into really just shows uh, percentages for students who uh, met both reading and writing and math or met neither. Um, and again, this, this slideshow will be shared with the public and with the board um, you know, at a later time this week. So what you see here are the distributions of the scores for the current seniors and um, the class of 2020 who just graduated in the spring. Um, the pink bar on each is that 530, the, the benchmark for um, career and college readiness. And so all of the scores to the, to the right or above that pink bar are the students who met benchmark. Um, the 2021 distribution is smaller because we had fewer students take the test this year because they could opt out. So the difference in, in that vertical axis shouldn't alarm anyone. It's just because we had fewer students taking the test this fall. Um, but what's interesting to note here is to look at the shape of the distribution and to see, you know, where did our students fall and how many students were, were falling in that upper quadrant and how many were, um, were closer to the average or below average. And that's gonna let us in future analysis think about how we might set different goals and set different, um, courses for improvement for these different sort of categories of students. So the next two slides show how our students um, did on the 2021, uh, sorry, our students in the class of 2021 and the class of 2020 did on the SAT the last two years by course. So um, obviously our, our students follow different tracks. Uh, they're not, they don't all take the same progression of math classes. And on the left-hand column here, you see uh, the courses listed. Obviously, you know, the, and these are average scores for the students in those courses. So for AP Calculus, there are 12 students and it gives the, their uh, average scores. The key at the top right shows um, in green, um, the, the, the areas and, and the, that students met or exceeded the benchmark. The yellow or orangish color is approaching, and then that sort of purple color is the students who uh, need to strengthen their skills or, um, you know, we're not near uh, meeting the benchmark. Um, so obviously, if you if you look at 2021, which is a, the class that just took it in October, and then the class that took it in the spring of 2019, which would be the um, class of 2020, you know, clearly which is not a surprise. Um, there's a correlation between 
level of math class and performance on the math SAT. Um, there are some interesting things to point out though, which Grace and I have discussed. Uh, heart of algebra, um, if you look at some of our top, you know, math students, uh, you can see my sister, but you know, didn't meet on average, didn't meet or exceed proficiency as a group for 2020 or 2021. So, you know, there's things, there's, there's a lot of things you can, you can get into here. We're not gonna, you know, break this down tonight, but um, you know, these are things that uh, especially Grace has, has looked into. So recommendations fall into two categories, the short term for this year's test takers, the current 11th graders, and then medium to long term for future test takers. Um, and all of this work is going to take place collaboratively between administrators and teachers. Um, we're going to think about how to be really intentional about the PSAT in January and have that be a day um, that students think about as training for the SAT in the spring uh, and using that baseline data to set improvement plans when we do a specific um, SAT preparation in the spring. Um, we will make a plan uh, as a math team to think about how we wanna prepare students for the SAT. Um, in typical years, there has not been a lot of formal preparation for that test. Um, we're not going to completely take over math courses, but to think about how we how can we embed SAT preparation um, in math courses, particularly in math three, where just over half of 11th graders are currently enrolled, um, and and then during FLT as well. And all of this is going to happen really through content specific professional development. So the math team working together to look at data, reflect, make plans, um, and see how things are changing. Uh, and then we have a laundry list of things to think about for the medium to long term. One thing we want to think about is by the end of this school year, investigating adopting a high quality standards aligned curriculum. And uh, when we're talking about scores of this type, um, we have a lot of room to grow, really thinking about the need to improve the core of our instruction or the core of what's happening in math courses. And that starts with what is the math that we're teaching in those courses? Um, we would also like to establish clear goals for each course and criteria for passing. We're seeing that kids have really different experiences at Sanborn based on the different tracks that they're following. And we'll be able to tighten that up by thinking about the goal of each course and how students move through that to have some more objective criteria for how students are placed in math courses and have those criteria be balanced with recommendations. Um, we've started to, and we're going to continue to refine our grading and assessment practices to ensure that we're teaching for mastery, right? Uh, it's a pedagogical question to be, to be teaching in a way to ensure that students are mastering content. Um, as has mentioned in subcommittees and, and elsewhere, we're going to look at the high school master schedule and think about the amount of time students are spending in math class and in other core content areas. Um, We'd like to develop a building-wide instructional focus, meaning to, to set a stake in the ground that as a building, we're going to focus on instruction and then build structures and routines that reinforce that focus at every level. The pandemic has put a lot um, in the way of us talking about instruction and folks are spending their time on, on masks and, and dividers and contact tracing. Um, but even as we move through the rest of this year and out of the pandemic, um, we want to build in structures that allow us to maintain that laser focus on teaching and learning. Um, and we're, we're going to need to either find or create intermediate measures of performance so that we know how we're doing and we can make adjustments along the way without waiting for the SAT every year just with the 11th graders. Um, this work is going to happen between administrators and teachers. We're going to be focusing on instruction during early release days, professional development days, and PLC time. So when you hear folks advocating for early release and for, for time built into the schedule for professional development, this is the kind of work that we're talking about.